Hi there, and welcome to More Hematology. I'm Dr. Alex, and we're going to talk about the CBC and differential. So let's just move right into hematology tests that are going to be covered in this voiceover PowerPoint. The CBC, the differential, and the reticulocyte count for sure. We're going to talk about those, and so you can read there what the components of a CBC are. And then we can look there under the differential to see what the differential test uh, measures. And we're basically looking at the percentage of each type of white blood cell that you have in your blood. And it also will reveal to us if there are any major abnorm abnormalities or immature cells. And I listed a few of them there for you, but we're going to talk about them in depth. And also we can get a reticulocyte count from the hematology test uh, known as the CBC with differential. So what do we got here? We have um, complete blood count, has a white blood cell count a red blood cell count, hematocrit hemoglobin platelets, and then our red blood cell indices, which is the MCV, the MCH, the MCHC, and the RDW. So just a little note here on limitations of reference ranges, and those of you who are in class with me heard my spiel on the limitation of um, reference ranges, so I would say to you not to memorize these reference ranges, but to also know that they're going to change based on geographical location and as, you know, things get updated in medicine and we know more. And also the factors here uh, listed on this screen will tell you that um, there are a lot of factors that affect the reference range. So iron deficiency, thalassemia medication, you can read that yourself. History and clinical examination is going to be really important in diagnosing your patient. I can't say that enough. So I just want to point out here that the impo important features of history and clinical examination that you already know, I don't want you to forget those. When you're looking at trying to diagnose someone based on a lab value, it's really difficult. So you want to consider all the elements of your history and clinical as well, such as fever, uh, if they're spleen or um, liver enlarged, uh, expo what, exposure to drugs and toxins, they have fatigue or weight loss, those kinds of things. And then back again to the total white blood cell count versus the absolute white blood cell count, which is something that we talked about in class. The absolute count of each cell type is more useful than the total because the total count can be misleading. So like low neutrophils with an elevated lymphocyte count may produce a total white count that falls within the reference range. And we're going to look at some examples of um, when that could become problematic and how we, we're going to get around that problem. And so finally, we need to interpret our results in a clinical context. So all hematology results must be interpreted in the context of a thorough history and physical exam as well as previous results. So again, I think I said that back here, and I'm saying it again. Make sure that you know what you're interpreting. So you can't just take, I mean, I suppose you could, but I wouldn't call it actually good medicine if you just looked at one value in the absence of anything else to determine uh, a diagnosis. I mean, there are some areas, some areas of medicine where one one test is considered, one lab value is considered diagnosis, uh, diagnostic in the absence of anything else, but we're not here right now. So right now we're talking about using everything that you have together in order to diagnose your patient. Which brings me to the hematology cases for this week, which if you haven't done those cases um, and, you d and you're going to, that's exactly what's going on with the week for hematology cases. I really want you to use your best clinical judgment. I don't care if you get the right answer. I absolutely couldn't care less. So we really just want you to be able to use your clinical decision-making skills that you're learning to develop um, a reasonable differential diagnosis and then a best guess on what you think the diagnosis is because they call it practice for a reason. Okay. So next here we have a CBC with differential and platelets. Here's an example of a normal you can't see anything out of normal because if you did see anything out of the normal value, it would be under that flag col column there. So the white blood cell, uh, total white blood cell count, I have a little pink arrow pointing at it. And then down there at the immature granulocytes, you'll see a little pink arrow pointing at that. And then just above the immature grands, you'll see uh, absolute values of never let monkeys eat bananas. And you can see that we're talking about absolutes versus totals already, even though you're not 100% sure, some of you at least, aren't 100% sure what that means. It's going to be clear here in just a second. Total white blood count may be misleading. The absolute count of each of the cell types is more useful than the total. So what did I say? The absolute counts, so let's go back, absolute counts, much more useful than the total. The total count is going to be misleading if, for example, you have low neutrophils with an elevated, lymph elevated, is that like an elephant that's fainted? An elevated, I have a little cold here, so it's kind of funny. I'm sure my voice sounds like I have a little cold, but 
whatever, it's going to be okay. Three small germy children. So the total count may be misleading. So if we have the low neutrophils, elevated lymphocyte count, we may have a total white count that falls within the reference range. So that would be misleading. And we also have to consider immature numbers like grands and bands. And what do I mean by grands versus bands or grands and bands? Sounds like the Crips and the Bloods or the, I don't know, I was going to think of something else that was funnier, but I can't really think of anything right now because it's like 700 degrees in here. Okay, so what about band cells? A band cell, which is also called a band neutrophil or a stab cell, is a cell that's undergoing granulopoiesis. And we've already talked about what poiesis of things mean in class, hematopoiesis, granulopoiesis. And that uh, band cell is derived from a metamyelocyte, and it leads to a mature granulocyte. The term immature granulocytes, or GRANs, is generally used to denote cells that are more immature than a band cell. So a GRANs cell is more immature than a band cell. Kind of counterintuitive, we think of, I call my grandmother Gran, or you may call your a grandparent Gramps. But Grans would be the opposite in this case. The Gran cell is more immature than the band neutrophil. So let's look at a picture's worth a thousand words in the smallest source type ever down there at the bottom, where you can see that Wikimedia is where this lovely picture came from. Don't worry, I've vetted it. It's a good picture. You don't have to worry. No citation needed. So hematopoiesis in humans. Let's look at the bottom and the kind of um, bluish color there across the bottom uh, to the right of the word blood. Thrombopoiesis, erythropoiesis, granulopoiesis, and then we have um, monocytopoiesis. And you can see that the granulopoiesis um, comes from the myeloblasts. And then we have those metamyelocytes dropping down into band cells and then dropping on down into basophils, neutrophils, eosinophils, and monocytes. And that gives you a really good representation of um, what we were talking about in the previous slide. So the immature granulocyte, okay, and then we go up there to the band cell, and those are derived from a metamyelocyte. So go back to our picture. Find your metamyelocytes, and then you can see where the bands come from. All right, so you, once you spend some time with that, it should make more sense. Again, band cells, a shift to the left, which is a term you'll hear in laboratory medicine, indicates the presence in the blood of neutrophils less mature than segmented neutrophils, e.g. band neutrophils in earlier stages such as metamyelocytes. And the next two slides have pictures. So there is a neutrophil in the circulating blood, and they're mainly mature segmented neutrophils. And now here's a band form of a neutrophil. And these are smaller numbers of cells of neutrophil lineage with non-segmented nuclei. And they're referred to as neutrophilic band cells or band forms. They're less mature than the segs. And an increased number of band cells is referred to as a shift to the left. Very important concept for you to understand. How do we make a neutro? Well, the earliest identifiable neutrophil precursor is our myelocyte, which differentiates into the metamyelocyte, then it goes on to be a band cell before it finally matures into a, a segmented neutrophil. I hope that these, like, four different ways of considering this will cover all the bases for how you guys are individual learners. Practice time. Let's look at 9, 10, 11, and 12 and identify the cell type indicated by the arrow there in number 9. I'll give you a second to look at that. And then identify the cell type indicated by the arrow there in number 10. Do the same in number 11. That one's a little tricky. I'll give you a hint. That's a trickier one. And then number 12, identify the cell type indicated by the arrow. And the answers are a neutrophilic myelocyte, a neutrophilic metamyelocyte, also known as a stab cell. We love to name things like 40 different things just to make it as difficult as possible. And then number 11, that's actually an erythroblast, a polychromatophilic erythroblast. And then in number 12, we have our eosinophilic myelocyte. And go back to slide 6 if you need to, but here's a little, um, a little insert of erythropoiesis where I show you the polychromatophilic erythroblast that you're seeing there in number 11. So if this isn't making sense to you, it's time to stop and go back 
And really all it is is what turns into what. You know, are you ever going to be asked to memorize this? Probably not. But what you need to understand is the big take-home message. And the big take-home message, oh my gosh, I sound like Dr. Modell for a second. That makes me kind of shudder a tiny little bit. Um, you know, he used to threaten us. And I swear, I think it was some kind of... Um, hypnotic induction, you know, like threaten us and not in a, like, I'm going to hurt you way, but threaten us in a, like, you will remember my voice sort of way. And in fact, it, it has proven to be true. So when you're, if you're in his class and you're listening to, you know, you students come back and tell me that they, they don't get it until five years later. Well, that's actually true. I, I have to say, I wish I didn't have to say that, but it is in fact true. So take time to go back and look at what goes to what to what, all the way down to the bottom of the cells that you recognize, because that's going to be really, really important, particularly for those of you going on to do naturopathic oncology and, you know, things where um, hematology are even more crucial. Okay, so what is this immature glands thing? Immature granulocytes, again, are white blood cells that have granules present in their cytoplasm. Well, that's not a big deal. I mean, that's not that different, really. In normal adults, the total number present in the blood should be less than 2% because high levels of immature granulocytes indicates that something's going on. The body's either has a, a severe stress, it could be caused by infection or cancer. We don't really know. And the absolute count of immature glands um, is the overall immature glands percentage compared to all the other types of white blood cells. And the immature glands are white blood cells that have granules present in their cytoplasm. Again, I think that's the dumbest definition ever. And if you think about that for a second, you will also think it's the dumbest definition ever, especially when we look at the next slide, because they sort of all have granules in their cytoplasm. But here we go. So we're starting there with the blood stem cell in the top right. And we're going down uh, all the way to our red blood cells, our platelets, our granulocytes, our agranulocytes. And we're looking at individual cell lines that come from our stem cell. And then if we look at the, the dark or the colored picture in the lower left corner, then we see the promyelocyte um, that ends up being different myelocytes. And then they end up being band cells and then all the way down to granular leukocytes. Okay, so that's just a pictorial representation of where the band cell falls. All right, and here's an example of a misleading total white blood cell count. Case one, Mr. Jones is a 54-year-old man with fever and fatigue. The CBC shows 2.0 times 10 to the ninth liters with the following differential. And I don't even care what normal is for white blood cells because I'm looking at the differential right now. So neutrophils, I've got 40%. That looks at the, you know, normal range. Lymphocytes look like they're a little over the normal little elevated. My monocytes are within normal limits, my EOS are within normal limits, and my basos are within normal limits. So at first glance, I see that the lymphocytes are high. All right, and then I go to example on slide two, and based on the review of this proportional differential and its associated reference range, one could conclude that the patient does have lymphocytosis, you know, albeit relative, and uh, pursue diagnostic considerations based on lymphocytosis. Lymphocytosis. But many of us um, have been a witness to clinical conversations similar to this. If these differential results are converted to absolute values, then the following data would be more appropriately evaluated. So let's see what happens when we actually look at the absolutes. Now neutrophils are low, 0.8. Lymphocytes are still within normal limits, are actually now within normal limits. Let's go back to our slide before. Lymphocytes were high. Now lymphocytes are normal, monocytes are normal, EOS are normal, and basos are normal. And so now we can easily recognize that the patient has a moderate neutropenia and may be at risk for some kind of infection. In addition, we now focus our diagnostic consideration on the cause of the neutropenia. And we also recognize that the patient does not, in fact, have a true lymphocytosis as the absolute lymphocyte count is at the lower end of the reference range. So I hope that makes sense to you. If not, let's look at a shift to the left of case two. Case two, shift to the left. Mrs. Smith is a 62-year-old woman with a history of rheumatoid arthritis, and she presents with a two-month history of increasing fatigue. CBC shows a white blood count of 80 and with the following differential. Neutrophils are normal. Immature granulocytes, there's none. Lymphocytes are low. Monos are normal. EOS are normal. And basos are normal. So based on the proportional differential, we can see that immature granulocytes are increased and lymphocytes are proportionally decreased. In comparison, the differential in the absolute numbers is going to show us a different story. 
Now our differential in the absolute numbers. Okay, we've got 56. Okay, 56 in neutros. We've got 16 in granulocytes. We've got 3.2 in our lymphocytes, and we've got 0.8 in monocytes, and we've got 3.2 and 0.8 in eosinophils and basophils, respectively. So what are we saying here? What's different here? Let's go back to that other slide. Immature granulocytes, 20%. The reference range is none. Neutrophils, 70%. Now we go over here and we have 56 which is considerably different than 6.8, the high end of the reference range. Okay, so now we easily recognize that the patient actually has neutrophilia with the left shift, eosinophilia and basophilia. So let's go back and look at that again. 0 0.8, 3.2. All right, look at those values. All right, now we go back. Now we can easily see that we have a left shift. Eosinophilia, neutrophilia, and basophilia. And this constellation of findings raises concern for a myeloproliferative neoplasm like CML, since reactive neutrophilia is not accompanied usually by eosinophilia and basophilia. And you know, I don't expect you to know that. What I do expect you to notice is the humongous difference in what it looks like versus what it actually is, these absolute and relative counts. So it's really important to take all the information that we can get before we head off down a diagnostic path. All right, and then here's a nice little cartoon slide of um, just you know telling you what the values are and what they mean and what their associated disorders of the CBC. CBC with differential and there's the indices. All right, now white blood counts. White blood counts, the number of white blood cells in a volume of blood. Normal ranges vary slightly between laboratories, and generally speaking, we have the value that you see here. And there's the leukocyte count in international units. And then we have what are white blood cells elevated in, infection and leukemia. And then depressed in chronic inflammation, bone marrow failure, some blood cancers, etc. All right, and so next we have red blood cell count, and that's going to be the number of red cells in a volume of blood. And we've already gone over this a lot, so I don't feel like I really need to go much into this. They are elevated in a condition called polycythemia, and they are depressed in anemia. All right, next is our hemoglobin, and this is the amount of hemoglobin in a volume of blood. All right, so hemoglobin is a protein in red blood cells that carries oxygen, as you may remember. And then here are the normal ranges, and I, I have these here for you to consider the difference in men and women for these normal ranges. All right, let's see here. I'm doing like three things at once, so let me just switch the slide. Next is our hematocrit, and our hematocrit, as you may remember from class, is just a packed cell volume, and that's the ratio of the volume of blood cells to the volume of whole blood. So when your hematocrit is, is high and it looks like you don't have enough water, perhaps your patient is dehydrated. And then here's some basic red blood cell measures. So these are just some basic information in terms of the units, reference ranges. And then here we go with our rule of three. And in general, you should see the same ratio between the three values of red blood cell hemoglobin and hematocrit. It's that 139 ratio. And you may have heard of this in your lab, your actual stab lab. And in patients um, who are like, for example, normocytic and have normochromic red blood cells, multiplying the hemoglobin by three is going to equal the hematocrit. And even when the numbers are abnormal, the ratio still generally applies. All right, so next on our indices, we've got mean corpuscular value. And that is the average volume of red blood cells, um, the average volume of a red blood cell that translates to the average red blood cell size. All right, so this is calculated from the hematocrit and the total red blood cell count. And you can see that the normal range is in something called femtoliters. And it can vary slightly between labs. And so if you want to do a mathematical derivation, the hematocrit percent times 10 over the red blood cell count is going to give you the MCV. MCV, and that's also the mean corpuscular volume again, the cell size classification. And we're talking about what does this look like when we translate it to to medical speak. 
and how we think about like anemia and diseases, disease states that might show up. We have normocytic, microcytic, and macrocytic. Normocytic, microcytic, and macrocytic, and they're the resultant values. So the red blood cell is within the normal range on size if it's normocytic. If it's microcytic, it's small. If it's macrocytic, it's big. And then here's an etiology of anemia based solely on the MCV value. Okay, and we've got macrocytic and what that can be, megaloblastic anemia, liver disease, etc. Normocytic, acute blood loss, hemolytic, aplastic, and those are anemias, and then microcytic, which is iron deficiency anemia typically. The next slide is just an algorithm of anemia classification, FBC, full blood count, same thing as CBC, complete blood count. And you can follow that down to low MCV, normal MCV, and raised MCV and what those might mean. It's just a pictorial representation for you who like to think like that. Next is going to be our mean corpuscular hemoglobin. And the, that is actually the amount or the average amount of hemoglobin in the average red blood cell. So this is calculated using the hemoglobin and the red blood cell. Again, you can do a mathematical derivation and determine what your MCH is should you decide to. This is going to be given to you on your report. Clinical association with MCH, remember to go to labtestsonline.org, and I don't get a kickback from them, but I sure do like them. And this will give you the same information that I'm giving you in a form that's going to be easy for you to flip back and forth. Easier than, you know, stopping this recording or going and downloading the PDF and whatever. Whatever works for you. Find, a, find something that works for you to be able to learn this. So increased MCH, we see increased MCH in macrocytic anemia where the cells are normochromic. And we see a decreased MCH in hypochromic anemia and the cells appear pale on slide examination. Okay, and next we have mean corpuscular hemoglobin. That's the MCHC, and that's the average concentration of hemoglobin in a given volume of red cells. And that's calculated from the hematocrit and the hemoglobin. So there's your mathematical derivation in the normal range. And MCHC is where those terms, hypochromic, normochromic, hyperchromic, come from. So the MCHC, mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, again, the average concentration of hemoglobin in a volume of cells, if it's normochromic, then the MCHC is within the reference range. If it's hypochromic, then the MCH is less than the reference range, and it may be low when the MCV is low. Okay, and it's decreased MCHC values are hypochromic. That's where you have hypochromic cells. And those are seen in conditions like iron deficiency anemia and thalassemia. Whereas hyperchromic, the MCHC is higher than the reference range, is seen in conditions where hemoglobin is more concentrated inside the red cells. And you're going to see those in autoimmune hemolytic anemia, burn patients, and hereditary spirocytosis. And again, a picture is worth a thousand words, so hyperchromic, normochromic, hypochromic, and then you can see macrocytes, normocytes, microcytes. It's a really nice cartoon slide. Okay, red cell distribution, the RDW, should say red cell distribution width, that's where the W comes from, is a simple measurement of the variability of the red cell size and shape. And the higher numbers indicate greater variation in size. There's your normal range, and it's often the first indication of anemia. And there's a lot of information on this slide, so let's take it a little bit slower, the clinical application. Take, for example, if your RDW is normal. Then we go back and we look at the MCV. The mean, what was the MCV? The mean corpuscular volume. Okay, MCV, the mean corpuscular volume. And we're talking about normocytic, microcytic, and macrocytic. Okay, so now we go back over here and we look at our RDW. We look at our RDW and we see that if we have the mean corpuscular volume as high when the RDW is normal, then we probably have aplastic anemia or pre-leukemia to consider. If we have a normal RDW and a normal MCV, then we may have acute blood loss, anemia of chronic disease, normal value, nothing wrong with the person at all, etc. And the MCV is low. We have anemia of chronic disease or thalassemia. There's another really small reference there from Family Practice Notebook. And then if the RDW is high, and I want to note here that a low value, I mean, think about it. Just work it out in your head. A low value would indicate a uniformity in the size of a red blood, uh, the red blood cell population in that particular sam sample. 
Because <laughs> if RDW is the measurement of the variability of the red cell size and shape, and it's low, well, then there's not that much variability. Okay, so that's just telling you that it's uniform size of red blood cells. If the RDW is high, then again, we're going to exa examine the main corp corpuscular volume, and we're going to see that if the, if the RDW is high and the MCV is high, we have some conditions associated. If the RDW is high and the MCV is normal, we have some conditions, and again, if it's low. All right, so let's go back to that MCW again. Mean corpuscular volume, it's the average size of the red blood cell. Okay, so they should have just called it size instead of volume, but volume and size are the same thing in this case, as you know, in a lot of cases. It's just we think of liquid versus solid often when we're thinking about volume from our, you know, junior high chemistry class where we first learned it. All right, so let's see, where are we now? Now we're going to look at a quick reference. So there's normal RDW, low MCV, normal RDW, normal MCV, uh, normal RDW, high MCV. This is just a really nice quick reference for you guys to consider what might be going on. Okay, this slide is about the differential revisited. And the differential is a relative percent and absolute count of white blood cell components that's usually done by a machine, but if you get a manual differential, the med tech's going to hand count and observe morphology from a peripheral blood smear. And again, there's what's involved in the differential. And then we have neutrophils, a picture of a neutrophil again. And that's a multi-lobe nucleus that has many names, PMN, SEG, segmented neutrophils. And you can see from Harrison's Internal Medicine, the definition. Okay, it's a fine neutrophilic granule dispersed in the cytoplasm and then a heavy clumped chromatin. All right, and there are eosinophils and basophils. Okay, you can see the eosinophil versus the basophil. Our neutrophils, monocytes, lymphocytes, and eosinophils and basophils. And now we're on to our platelet count, which we talked about this in class a lot, so I don't feel like we need to really go into a lot of detail. But a platelet count is going to tell us the number of platelets in a specified blood volume. And we have some normal ranges here we can consider. And then here's our mean platelet volume, the average size of platelets in a volume of blood. All right, and then on to our abnormal red cell morphology. And I gave you the reference for this hematology um, uh, outlines.com, this atlas. It's fantastic. Please do go there. This is a really great website. Okay, and these are stolen straight from that website, which is why they're referenced. So that's a public, uh, encourages public usage. So I felt perfectly fine with referencing it and using it in this PowerPoint. Microcytic RBCs, uh, our MCV is less than 80. There's some pictures. Our microcytic RBC causes, they on that website had a mnemonic, puny ticks, puny for pyridoxine deficiency. Never heard this one before, but I guess if you don't have enough pyridoxine, you could be puny. Um, thalassemia, iron deficiency, chronic disease, anemia, and sideroblastic anemia or lead poisoning. Here's our macrocytic RBCs and the MCV volume associated. And then here's the macrocytic RBC causes. And acanthocytes. Here's our first discussion of acanthocytes, at least you, and, you the two of us, our first discussion, or the 100 of us. I'm not sure how many people are going to listen to this. And there's your spur cell. Okay, acanthocyte, often called a spur cell, and it's increased in end-stage liver disease and post-splenectomy are the two big ones. Could be an artifact. Next is our echinocyte or burr cell. Looks a little bit like the spur cell. Okay, no central pallor, irregular projection of the red cell membrane. This one's evenly distributed, uniform-sized spicules. And then what causes the echinocyte? Well, artifact could be an old specimen, chronic renal disease, liver disease, and hyperlipidemia. There's our helmet cells or our schistocytes. They do look like helmets. They usually lack a central pallor, kind of look like a, you know, they sort of look like uh, Doris from uh, Meet the Robinsons, you know, the hat thing. You guys don't watch TV, but it's a really funny kids movie. So schistocyte causes increased in... Microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, severe burns. You can see why uh, mechanical causes would create these. Valves chewing them up. Here's a bite cell. Looks like they've been bitten. And bite cell causes are G6PD. There's your fava beans. You guys, I'm sure Kent had a great song for that. I'd love to hear it, actually. 
And then unstable hemoglobin disorders and oxidative drug effect. There's our ovalocytes or elliptocytes. Okay, rod shaped with rounded ends. And what are they increased in? Severe, severe iron deficiency anemia and some hereditary things. There's your spherocytes, RBCs with no central pallor. And what, what are those from? Nothing good. Okay, and stomatocytes named because of their mouth-like look. Okay, slit-like or mouth-like central pallor, and there is what they are increased in. Again, nothing good except for artifact, which is nothing at all. Target cells look like target cells, bullseye appearance. And why would you see a target cell? Well, there you go. Could be an artifact of slow drying blood, so I'm going to say you guys will probably see these in lab as an artifact. And you might just create that so you can see them. Okay, and then there's sickle cells. They look exactly like a sickle, crescent or a banana. And those are increased in sickle cell, of course, and some um, sickle cell anemia, I should say, and beta thalassemia. And there's our teardrop cells. And teardrop causes myelofibrosis. So I've got too much fibrosis in my myelo. That's never good. Bone marrow infiltration by hematologic or non-hematologic malignancy. And then an artifact in which the tails usually point in the same direction. So then you would guess that it was an artifact if they were all uniformly pointing. And there's Rouleau. We'll talk about Rouleau more. we got like five more slides to go. So we're going to talk about Rouleau here, in, I think, in the next to the last slide. But that's when four or more red blood cells stack like coins. Okay, and what causes that? Well, neoplasms, plasma cell myeloma, chronic liver disease. I mean, you're noticing the liver. Sh you should be noticing the liver shows up with a lot of these um, uh, aberrant cells. Chronic infections, chronic inflammation, evaluating the wrong area of a slide, that thick area of the slide. I encourage you to get a pseudo rouleau going so you can see what it looks like in lab. And then hematology atlas pictures. I'm just going to run through those really fast. These are just larger pictures from the online atlas. I forgot these were in here. So I guess we have a few more than five slides. And so these are representative samples of the ones you should remember. Red blood cells, white blood cells, thrombocytes or platelets. There's some elliptocytes and some target cells. There's some teardrop cells and some stomatocytes. There's sickle cells and schistocytes. And then uh, that brings us to what's known as RBC inclusions. And the three that I'm interested in you knowing today are Howell Jolly bodies, basophilic stippling, and Pappenheimer bodies. And so Howell Jolly bodies are histopathological findings of basophilic nuclear remnants, or clusters of DNA, in circulating red blood cells. So during maturation in the bone marrow, the red blood cells normally extrude or expel their nuclei, but in some cases a small portion of the DNA remains, and the presence usually signifies that something's up with the spleen though you can see Howell Jolly bodies in celiac patients. And I'm going to show you a picture here in a second. <clears throat> Basophilic stippling, you're looking at the ribosome, and you're going to see that in sideroblastic anemia, mostly lead poisoning, which is probably, if you get asked that on a board exam, that's going to be the answer is lead poisoning. Arsenic poisoning or thalassemia, and then Pappenheimer bodies are abnormal granules of iron that are found inside red blood cells on routine blood stain. And you're going to see those also in hemolytic anemia, sideroblastic anemia, and sickle cell. So there's your Hal Jolly bodies. Okay, what were those? Okay, there they are, Hal Jolly bodies. There's the definition. Okay, and then ha there's the picture. There are basophilic stippling, lead poisoning, and Pappenheimer bodies, hemolytic anemias and sideroblastic anemia. All right, we talked about reticulocytes in class, but re reticulocytes are erythroid precursors that develop in the bone marrow at rates usually determined by the requirement that the body needs for sufficient circulating hemoglobin, and they're released into circulation as reticulocytes, and they remain in circulation for one day before the reticulate is excised by the uh, mononuclear phagocyte system, the MPS, with the delivery of the mature erythrocyte into circulation. It's a pretty nice little system. And there's the reticulocyte. You can see it still has uh, under supravital stain. Oh, didn't mean to hit that button. You can still see what's going on inside there. So if we read, we can see that what happens when this goes into circulation is it's not fully done yet. All right, so there it is. And then it turns into a mature 
erythrocyte. So the stain, the blood smear with methylene blue, you can count the number of retics. And uh, usually it's counted in the number per 1,000. I'm not counting these. I'm going to have the lab person do it. You guys are going to learn to count it, and then you're never going to count it again. So there's the corrected retic count. Because a decreased hematocrit may falsely elevate the retic count. So we correct that retic count by multiplying the reticulocyte count by the hematocrit and then dividing by a standard of 45. And I'm sure you're going to talk about this in your actual stab lab, but I just wanted to introduce this to you. And the reticulocyte production index is the maturation time of the reticulocytes, and when needed, the marrow releases cell er cells early, and that's the take-home message here. And the maturation time is based on the hematocrit. So you correct for early release of reticulocytes using the maturation time, and there's the der the um, calculation, if you, mathematical derivation if you're interested. Okay, and then here's an example. Patient suspected in a hemolytic state. We have a hemoglobin of 12, we have a hematocrit of 36, and the retic count is 10%. Okay, and there we can do the math. Reticulocyte count assesses how effective the erythropoiesis might be. So that's really what you need it for. And there's a reference range, and we order a retic count, excuse me, <coughs> a retic count to differentiate anemia and to follow the effectiveness of the treatment of anemia. All right, and these truly are the last two slides, I believe, and that's our test for inflammation, or at least the last two concepts, and that's the, it says ESP. Isn't that funny? It really means ESR, so extra sensory perception or erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Hmm, you be the judge, or CRP, C-reactive protein. So what's the ESR, not the ESP? Well, that's where you look for nonspecific marker of inflammation based on a really outdated test. So in typically red blood cells electrostatically repel each other, but when you have an inflammatory process present, there's a high portion of fibrinogen in the blood and that causes the red cells to stick to each other. And as we discussed earlier and you saw a picture, that's called a rouleau. And those heavy, you know, coins stacked on top of each other fall faster. So they settle out faster, and that changes the sedimentation rate. So as it sounds, you're looking at how fast the red blood cells fall through solution, and that is the sed rate. So it's very nonspecific, and there's lots and lots of limitations. Female hormones, um, vibration and tilt, you know, somebody bumps the table, uh, anything can happen. So it's basically a poor likelihood ratio performance for many conditions. And the reason you would use an ESR is because it's cheap and you're looking for the macro inflammation. Because if it comes back super duper high, then you know you got to do some more testing. But if it comes back a little bit or equivocal, you know, then you've got to decide in the presence of symptoms and physical exam and history and all that stuff. I prefer the C-reactive protein, which by the way is not the same thing as a high sensitivity CRP, which is on your other slide show that you may have looked at. And not the same thing. High sensitivity CRP is specific to the heart. The C-reactive protein itself is a useful test in monitoring people with chronic inflammation, and so you can use it to detect flare-ups or determine if your treatment's working. And some examples of when you might get a C-reactive protein or you might run a C-reactive protein would be inflammatory bowel disease, uh, arthritis, uh, autoimmune diseases such as lupus or vasculitis. And the last slide is questions. Remember the labtestonline.org. I hope that you got something out of the slideshow and have a great rest of your day.